will be, you'll take things you like and you'll, maybe you'll bring it to your stable. So I'm just going to go a step at a time. And it's, it could be edited a little bit more. Maybe when I send out to edit it more, okay? Um, okay, so we have here all these, this is like all the stuff I'm sure. Okay, so let's go. Seder order. So Rav Soloveitch is something very beautiful. Like what was, so we have many, the Seder, it's very unique. On Rosh Hashanah, we have Simani. We have like an order of how you go to Beth. There's an order over here. Oh, you want one? Yeah, please. Okay. Which cup do you prefer? Um, but the one in that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you. All right. Um, so, Seder Pesach is very unique. It's called a Seder. It's very organized. So we don't have. It's very unique. There's like 15 stages. Why? Why all this Seder? Why this organization? So there are different approaches to this. No, this isn't for a prop for the thing. You just are thirsty. Yeah, oh, okay. Now, at your center pass up, some people have a custom of taking water. I'm just like, dropping the water for a pass. <laughs> All right, um, so this is for me. I'm thirsty. We're going to lean to our left. Now. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, all right, so Rasul Vesha says, what's, what's, the, what's so this, this order, the purpose of it, another approach to like the order of it, is this supposed to bring you from the mind to the heart? This is really beautiful. I mean, you start out, you're talking about it, you're going through magi, then you eat. That helps you kind of like um, think about symbols in a, in a certain way, think about it. That eventually brings you to praise and to song. The whole Seder's purpose is to like really impact you, that it goes from your mind to your heart, to the point that you start singing to God at the end in the, in the section which is called uh, Hallel and then Nirza, which song. So I think it's like a beautiful explanation. Um, it's like a little bit of an interesting explanation. Reb Merrill of Premishlan is he's like actually kind of like a, a contemporary with, uh, with of Karlaban. He says something interesting. I, I think it's okay, not great, but he says what he says. Kadesh means to um, how do you make Kadesh means to make yourself holy. How do you do that? You do that through or or chatz. Or chatz means to clean. You clean so you clean up. You have to remove yourself from all negativity. It's how you become holy, how you prepare yourself for money. Afterwards, you have car pas. Car is pillow, pas is bread. So basically, you prepare things for those in need, right? Yachatz means you break. You break the bread. You break off bread for others. This, you orient, orient yourself. You remove yourself from negativity. You orient yourself towards giving to others. And through that, then you can share the story, which is magi, which is the next section. So basically, the order of these first parts are to kind of like hint to you the fact that your orientation should be towards others. So when you get to Magid, you're telling the story about Egypt, it's supposed to inspire you to want to help those who are in need, just like Hashem helped you. So that's these first parts, I get to hint to that. It's uh, uh, to remove yourself from negativity. Kar pas, kar means pillow, pas means bread. That was means to break off. And then sharing the story, which is Magid, and that brings you to Magid. Okay. Um, I like this that if Hidushe Harim says, um, he says that all the miracles, so why is there a Seder? Because all the miracles in Egypt were in happenstance. They were in precise order from Hashem. That's why we have a Seder. That's why our, we, our Seder is called a Seder. It's a hint to us that Hashem's miracles were all in a special order, precisely the way Hashem wanted them to be, which I think is something that sometimes people think miracles are kind of arbitrary. That's where we're not, we're not supposed to think that way. So that's a little bit on the Seder, the order of the Seder. Here's a thought I came up with when it comes to the Seder flip this year. I put this in our little video that we put out from Beth to Philo this year. Um, on the Seder plate, we have multiple things. Uh, you can see it in your Haggadah. There's a picture of the Seder plate on page three. There are many different types of ways that people organize the Seder plate. So, uh, some have five, some have six, some have 10, 12. But I like this idea. Like, Why is it so important to have a Seder plate out? The Seder plate hints to all of our history, basically. The good times and the bad times. We had the sacrifice with something positive. We had the maror with something negative. And we're displaying it. We're displaying it. We're owning our history. We're owning the good times and the bad times. You can only, if you're running away from your past and your history, um, that can lead to like a weak present. So we want to be strong, own up to our past, the things we've gone through, and also the positive time, not hide from it. We're displaying it all for ourselves and for others during Passover so that we can grow from it and learn from it. So that's why we're displaying it on a sacred plate. That's one way to understand it. Rabbi? Rabbi? Yes. Uh, I was reading a book by Nathan Lawfer. Does anybody know Rabbi Nathan Lawfer? 
And he said that when you display it on the Seder plate, it's telling the story. If you do it in the order in which it's supposed to be, it tells the story of, of our people as well. So it's just another way of telling the story. So he's been, we're saying basically the same thing or? Yes. Cool. I thought I thought about that idea. Maybe I read his once upon a time. I thought it was fine. <laughs> anyway, maybe he heard my next joke. Okay. So <laughs> why do we have an egg on the Seder plate? So some of these are some of these are like technical, some of them are deep, deeper. There's, we're gonna I'm just giving you as many as I can. Okay. Why have an egg in a Seder plate? So I I think this is Rosh Hashanah, but the egg is supposed to correspond to the korban, the sacrifice, the chagiga sacrifice. In Passover, we had two sacrifices. We had the chagiga, which is brought at every holiday, and we had the shank bone, which is the Passover sacrifice. You brought two sacrifices. We have them both on our plate. Rosh Hashanah says, I think it's Rosh Hashanah. He said to remind us of um, that we're still in a broken state because you eat uh, the egg in the time of mourning. So uh, as a mourner eats eggs. And it's this idea, like, even though we're celebrating our, our momentous salvation, things are not complete yet. And maybe it's to hint to us that we should, the Seder Pesach should propel us to do good things in the world. Because if we, have, uh, we think about what we went through, we should think about other people going through as well. Uh, I, just like, I thought it was like a nice idea. Um, the, the egg, the more, it says in the Torah, the more that the Egyptians oppressed us, the stronger we became. And so the egg, the more that you boil it, like the stronger, the, the, more, the harder it, it becomes. So it's like maybe why we use an egg. Um, let's talk about uh, the four cups. So the four cups, I just thought this was like a nice idea. Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, and Leah. This appears in uh, the Maral talks about this and others talk about this as well. The four cups can hint to the four matriarchs. Why them specifically? Because it says in their merit, we were liberated from Egypt. So we're, we're trying to think about them with each cup. Another idea is the four languages. There's four languages, the central explanation, there's four languages of redemption that appear in the Torah. So it's Seti, Vitsalti, Vigaalti, Vigaalti, and there's one more. There's, there's, there's four. Uh, okay, there's four. Maybe this verse doesn't bring it. There's four. Um, so why four cups with four languages? I like this a lot. With each new cup that you drink, you are you get a little bit more inebriated. You get a more elevated. More like your energy opens up a little bit. You get more. So this idea is like with each new language of redemption that appears in the Torah, we, were, we got to a, a further form of redemption. So we're drinking a, bottle, a cup of wine each time to elevate us to like an even higher or deeper level of connection or like experience at the Seder. So I think that, I, I think that like corresponds really nicely with the four languages. You're supposed to experience yourself becoming more redeemed with each new cup. Okay, so uh, let's talk about, uh, I like this idea of the barber now. I talked about this in one of my videos. So why four cups of, of why four cups? Again, it talks about Kadesh. So a barber does this, talks about four, not just the four languages, I put this up here actually. Not just four, uh, not just the four, four languages in Mitzrayim, rather four stages of our of redemption throughout Jewish history. This idea that God is with us in each stage of history, and God will continue to be with us. So he talks about um, God, God, uh, the first one was um, found, uh, God chose Abraham, then Egypt, then uh, exile, and then the redemption. So this idea that God's with us in each stage of history, not just the four languages in Egypt. So when you drink each cup of wine, you remember a different stage of history. This idea that God will continuously be with us throughout all, all of our lives. Here's an interesting question. Um, Kadesh. Kadesh is the first part of the Haggadah. You can look at, if you want to open up to page, uh, page five, that's Kadesh. Now, Kadesh is an interesting language because really it's Kiddush. What's Kadesh? Kadesh is Kiddush. Make a Kiddush in every Yom Tov and every, 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 uh, every Shabbat. So why is the language Kadesh? Kadesh means to sanctify. And so uh, Yosef Suryaman says, why do we open up with this language of Kadesh? Because Kadesh means to sanctify. When you, are, when, you're, um, when you are in bondage, you can't sanctify your time. You don't have the freedom to do so. Same thing, like when you're in deep poverty, you don't have, time, you don't have luxuries, you don't have time to start thinking about all kinds of, you're very busy, you're, you're always struggling to, to make, make ends meet. When you are free, you're a free person, you, you have the ability to sanctify your time and to think about what you want to do with it and make it special and important. So this is what we're supposed to be focusing on at the very beginning of Seder. We are free, Baruch Hashem, 
relative to previous generations. And we want to try to intentionally make that make this like holiday special through intentionally thinking about what we're doing. That's why we open up with the language of Kadesh and not just Kiddush. Kiddush means to make to sanctify. Kadesh means to like that you are you're sanctifying time. Kadesh Kadesh does not. I think that's like a nice explanation he has. Now what's really interesting is if you look at on page um, four, there's only one um, part of the 15 steps that starts with a vav. Which one is it? I'll give you a hint. Kadesh Orachat. Orachat starts with a vav. A vav means and. None of them say and. It's just the name of the part of, uh, of that stage. Why is this one and? It's a nice explanation um, offered by uh, of, uh, Rav Simcha Bonham, the Lev Simcha, Rav Simcha Bonham Alter. He says, why is there a vav? Because or a, usually the way that you elevate yourself spiritually is through first removing yourself from something negative and then sanctifying yourself, right? But here we reverse the order. We have Kadesh, then Orchatz. You sanctify yourself, then you cleanse yourself. So he says, because we reverse the order on such a holy day that we can even start sanctifying ourselves before we even purify ourselves, we Kadesh, and then we bring it back to the normal order. So then we come back to and, then the whole order starts again. So that's why you have an and there. Did you get that kind of or not? Okay. So you did or not. Okay, let's move on. That's like a little bit of a deeper one. But um, I love this explanation for car pots, okay? This is, like, this is like one from I've talked about previous years. What's car pots? Okay, we're on now the third part of page four, car pots. Car pots is when you dip... Um, you dip a vegetable in salt water or lemon juice in some some communities. It could be uh, it could be whatever you want. It could be like a, a potato. It could be a green a, a greeny vegetable. Why do we well, or leafy vegetable? Why do we do that? So one explanation is this is to like arouse the children to start asking questions. Why do we do that? Another explanation is this was like they used to have, it's like kind of like a hors d'oeuvre type thing. And, and I know it's not like a fancy one, but back in uh, free people they have like these. First, like these like uh, wonderful, beautiful hors d'oeuvres, so basically like dipping a piece of parsley in salt water. But the idea that like they, the free people have that, but a really nice explanation is people talk about a lot. And I love this explanation. And it's like really is a framing for the whole Seder, okay? Um, the Karpas, we call the fancy coat that Yaakov Avinu <clears throat> gave to Yosef. Why? This ultimately led to our descent to Egypt. The brothers were jealous of Yosef. <clears throat> they sold him into slavery. Yosef went down to Egypt. The brothers had to come down. And eventually we got enslaved there. It all started with the jealousy of the brothers. We begin the Seder from the very beginning of how this all started, from the jealousy of the brothers. How do I, So what's the connection? It says that Yosef's uh, fine linens are referred to in scripture as karpas. We are dipping the karpas. Like the brothers dipped the fine linens of Yosef in blood. We were remembering Yosef at the very beginning. Why? Remember what brought us to this. What brought us to be enslaved is that we were not treating each other nicely. That we were jealous of each other. And that we were infighting. We, this is what we're supposed to be thinking about at the Seder Pesach. How do we correct the source of everything that brought us down to Egypt in the beginning? That's how we begin with Karpas. It's like, I think it's a great idea. Karpas is literally, it's literally described as Karpas. Fancy linens. His fancy linens were dipped. So therefore we dipped it and we want to remember Yosef. Maybe we're dipping in tears. We're going to remember the tears and all the pain that they went through. So I think it's like a, like a nice explanation. Have you heard that one before? Yeah. I think that's a really nice explanation. People often offer this. Um, and so I think it's a beautiful explanation. Another few, uh, two more beautiful explanations. We're getting some like, more beautiful explanations here. A little bit out of the technical pieces. But uh, Yachatz, we're on page uh, four. Yachatz is the fourth stage. Yachas. Oh, it's a beautiful idea, Rough Cook. Whenever I explain Rough Cook's ideas, I always, I always say they're beautiful. I, I think they are. So what are we doing in Yachatz? We break the middle matzah and hide a half of it for the afikoma. Do we hide the smaller one or the bigger one? Bigger. Right? Someone said the smaller, but they really meant the bigger, right? Bigger. Yeah. So we hide the bigger one, right? What? What do we do? We break part of it. We keep the small. We raise, we raise it up. We say, Halachma, this is the poor man's, poor person's food, right? Okay, uh, take a look. If you want to take a look. Whoever's here up in the Haggadah, you can take a look. Uh, page eight, it says, the master of the house. Okay, 
full, it's like a full language here, breaks the middle matzah in the plate, leaving the half of it there. He puts aside the other half till the, after some put the comen. The smaller part we pick for pick up for halachmania. The larger part we put away for the afiko. Why are we doing this? The larger part we eat later. It's a beautiful idea. Of Cook says at the moment of broke, it's the moment of brokenness, right? We are breaking. We're breaking the matzah. This is to hint to us that in our moments of brokenness, great redemption can come, right? So we're hiding the larger piece for later. So a larger, the afikomen hints to the Seder Pesach, which is like a positive thing. So it's, we hide it. Why do we hide it? In our moment of brokenness, we, we're hot, we have a broken matzah, we have a larger one that's being saved for later that we're eating to replace the, the Korban Pesach, which celebrates our redemption. We eat the afikomen later on to celebrate our rede- the Korban Pesach. We are hiding it because in our moment of brokenness, we can't always see the salvation, but it's there. It's hidden. We hide the salvation. You can only see it after you get through all of Magi. The whole stages of Magi, we talk about how God saved us. Then only at the end of Magi do we eat it. We eat the larger piece. It could be even larger redemption. We eat it corresponding to the Passover. The Passover sacrifice, which is our redemption, which signifies how God passed over our houses. So that's the idea. We break it into the moment of brokenness. Even in that moment, our larger salvation is hidden. And we can only see that later on after we see the bigger picture. We go through all of Magi. I like that idea a lot. I think sometimes like when we're going through hard things, it's very hard to see how any of it makes sense. But this, the deeper belief is that many times through this process, something bigger is going to, going to emerge. We just have to have the faith that it might be hidden right now from us. But if we see the bigger picture, we'll be able to see it at the end and be able to enjoy it. Faith, faith, and I think faith in God's salvation. That's the whole idea of Passover. I, I, I really like that idea. I remember I shared this in the beginning of uh, in 2020. I just posted it on Facebook actually at a Seder Pesach during uh, during COVID, and uh, we were all in our homes by ourselves. Remember that a long time ago? Well, it seemed like a long time ago. And like, and we we're trying to uh, strengthen people's faith, knowing that like we don't know what's going on. We're hoping good things hopefully will emerge from from us through that. So it's oftentimes hidden from us, but but it, it can emerge when we see a bigger picture. I like that idea a lot. Here's it, what? Things happen, for a reason. Things happen for a reason, but it's hidden. That's why we hide it. And then it can emerge later on after you go through the whole story. That's why it's safun. That's why we hide it. And it can be bigger even. It's a bigger piece. So that's in our moment of brokenness, remember that. Okay, the Baba Varevi. I like this idea too. You're beginning to tell the story. Magi. Right, so right before Magi, we have we break we break the matzah. Yachatz comes right before Magi. Why? Because we're about to tell the story. We need to, we break it because we don't have the whole story. Everybody has a part of the story. Everybody at the seder brings a different part. So you need everybody's part to contribute to the full narrative for you to have the full connection, like full understanding of the story. That's why we want to incorporate a lot of people. So there's a certain brokenness in the beginning to hint to that your story is not the full story. You need to hear other people's opinions too to build up the full narrative at the Seder Pesach. So you need to engage different opinions. So that's a little bit on Yachat. Um, so I like this idea. So, uh, let's take, so here's um, a few things connected to Magi. Magid's on page, um, let's get to Magid. Magid is on page, page eight. Page eight begins with Halachma, Halachma Anya. This is the bread of affliction. The bread of affliction. Right, we pick up the bread of affliction and we say that this is our bread of affliction. Um, well, we have like a lot to get through. I'm going to pick up my, pick my, my favorite things. Okay. Um, why do we say this? Is a, why, why, it's very interesting. What do we say here? This is the bread of affliction, which our forefathers ate in Egypt. Then we invite everybody to come in. So uh, the Maral since points out that many times what you, the orders, it's the wrong order here. Usually when you invite some, first you invite somebody and then you tell them what's on the menu. But here we're proclaiming, this is what we have. Let's invite everybody in. Usually you invite everybody and say, this is what we're serving. Okay, it's not the best meal. We had the bread of affliction. Man, hopefully you'll enjoy this bread of affliction, whatever. But like, usually you invite people and then you tell them what's on the menu. So what's the idea here? This is, this, when you say this is the bread of affliction, you're not just saying it for the guests. You're saying it for yourself. You're saying it for yourself because you also have brokenness, right? We also have brokenness in our lives. So when you understand your brokenness, you can make space for other people's brokenness as well. You can be more humble towards them. So we first we can recognize 
that we all, no one's perfect. We're not perfect either. Then you invite everybody in, then you can connect to them on a deeper level because people are in need around you, just like you're in need as well. So I think that's like a nice explanation for that. Um, I love this. Um, I love this idea here. I'm going to share this with you. Our Stern book says like this. If you turn to page, um, remember the second part we talked about uh, on page 11, uh, we talked about uh, Rav's Haggadah, which talks about we were long to, our forefathers were worshippers of idols. Remember, we talked about the spiritual way of explaining the story. We were wor- idol worshippers, right? Why do we begin the story according to Rav with that? I love this idea. It says, Long, long ago, our forefathers were worshippers of idols. Now the eternal is our God and we worship him, right? So, why do we begin with this? We begin with this to show that all of us can come close to Hashem on this, on this day. Right? Even our forefathers, both idol worshippers, God brought them closer. You might come to the Seder and be like, you know, how can I come close to Hashem? How can I grow from the Seder? Everybody can. Our forefathers, our foremothers, they were idol worshippers, but Hashem brought them close nevertheless. So this is kind of like framing for us, like this idea that we can all be redeemed, we can all elevate ourselves, and Seder Pesach, no matter where we are. Okay? Um, I have some really cute of our tourists, uh, but I've shared this in recent years. Anybody remember... Anybody remember? Let me see. Anybody on Zoom? I love this Dvar Tara, um, but I, I, if I've told it to you before, I don't want to share it again. You know, when you have that part here, look on page, uh, look on page, uh, here we go. page 18. We have the part where Rabbi Yossi of Glili says, There's, there's, um, so what is it? There was 50 plagues. Rabbi Yezer said there was. I think it was like 200 plagues. And Rabbi Akiva says there's 250. Remember that? Mm-hmm. Did anybody remember my Dvar Torah connect to that? Raise your hand if you did. What about on Zoom? Anybody on Zoom? Anybody remember anything I taught last year? All right. Uh, this, is the, this is the greatest way to explain this. So it's pretty, people are pretty amazed by this. Okay, let me explain this to you. What's this? Is this, a, is this like an auction? Anybody have 50 plagues, 200 plagues? 200, what are we doing here? Why are we naming how many plagues? Why does... It, it, was, not, this, it, it reminds me of when you're sitting around all night and drinking and everything, and each one's trying to outdo the other, almost sounds like, too. And the stories get bigger and bigger, and, and so. Yeah, so, correct. They're getting drunk, and they're getting a little. So, that's really good, too. I like that a lot. That's the hint to you that, like, as you think about it more and more, you think more, more and more about how the salvation ex- extends or expands. Here is Rav, Rav Sharkey. Rav Sharkey, one of my rabbis, explained this like in a really cool way. Okay, and this is like a cute, if you have like a minute and a half at your Seder to explain something, this is a cute thing to explain. All right, so Rav, Rav Sharkey asks like, why are these numbers? We have here on page um, on page 18, we have someone counting those 50 plagues on the sea. Then we have here, um, we have here on page uh, 18, we have then 200 and 250. So let's add these up. How much is that? 50 plus 200 plus 250. How much is that? What? 50 plus 200 plus 250. 250. Wait, let's see. Uh, wait, that's it. So it should be 300. Let's say. It should be 300. Yeah, 300. Let's, let's do the math again. Um, 50, 200, and 250 is 500. Let's see this again. Oh, 10 on, so let's do this again. Rabbi Yossi says this, 10 on the sea and 50 uh, in Egypt. How many is that? 60. Okay, 10 in Egypt and 50 on the sea, 60. Okay. Rabbi Yezer says, um, okay. so he says like this, um, in Egypt there were 40. What are we at now? 100. 100. And on the sea, there were 200. 300. 300, okay. Now he says like this. Uh, Rabbi Akiva says, there are 50 in Egypt and 250 on the sea. 600. Okay, now that's three accounts. But those aren't all the accounts of the plagues. Go back a page. Go back a page. We have Rabbi Yehuda's account. There are three here. Detzach Adash Bachav. How much is that? Three? He has an acronym. Tatach Adash Becha. How many? That's three. What are we at now? Six hundred and three. Well, let's go back a page. We have the first account of the play. There's ten. That's six thirteen. All right. So okay, you can say it's it's just just randomly put there. 
Or you could say, perhaps there's some sort of hint, something going on here. There's just like there's 613 mitzvot. If you go the wrong way, you can, you can find yourself in 613 plagues. Maybe there's a deeper explanation of this too. But it's just interesting to have 613 and 613. I like that explanation. People seem to like that. Did you like that one too? All right, cool. Um, let me, uh, let's keep going. All right. Um, let me find something. It's a lot more I can go into that right now. Um, All right, let's see. (laughs) (laughs) All right, here's my favorite explanation. What? Here's my favorite explanation. So here, okay, I want to go through two more. I want to go through two more things with you and then talk about like some things that you can do at your Seder uh, to to spice it up. Um, Korach, here's an idea uh, that I like. I, th- I think I thought of this year, but maybe, maybe I saw it somewhere. Anyway, you have two dippings, right? So if you turn to page five, there's the dipping in the beginning of the Seder with the, the carpas, okay? The carpas, there's two dip- well, he says, on every other night, we, di- we don't dip at all. We don't dip at all. We don't dip even once. On Passover, we dip twice. What are the two dippings? The carpas in the beginning, and then towards the end of Magi, we have, uh, we have korech, which is the ninth stage. You dip the bitter herb uh, in, uh, you, you eat the bitter, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, with, with, you dip it in charose. These are two yeah. dippings. The first dipping is like, well, I would say before you begin, it's a salty one. It's like a bitter one. The second one, you take the maror, you dip it in something sweet. So I think this hints to the idea also. Once you get through all the magi, then you could see how, the bitter can become sweet, like the, the negative can become positive. That's what the Seder Pesach is supposed to remind you of. That's, that's why there's two dippings. That could be one way to understand the two dippings. Um, I thought, okay, I like this idea a lot. I don't know if I can share this with you in like, in like, in like two, like, a, like half a minute. But the matzah, there's a lot of symbolism behind the matzah. Um, some say it's the, the bread of affliction, right? It's, uh, that's what it's called. Lechem oni. Um, let me change this. Some say it's the bread of faith. The Zohar said it's the bread of faith. Rabbi Seth Hurstick, who's a friend of mine, he says something really beautiful. He says it's uh, it's called the bread of affliction. I love this idea. It's like I never heard this before. He says Rav Asher. He says one sees the matzah in a much more positive light. Matzah, he explains, is not entirely the bread of affliction. Is the bread of, our people ate when they were afflicted? So it's called the bread of affliction, right? The Torah says. It's lechem oni, but it's not just to remind us of our affliction. It says, it's the bread that we ate during our affliction. Meaning, it says that they also ate bread. They all ate bread. They ate matzah in Egypt. The Torah says it. They ate matzah when they were in Egypt. That's what we say. Halach ma'anya. This is the bread that we ate. Diachalu. That 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 our that our forefathers ate in the land of Egypt. So we ate matzah in Egypt. We ate matzah when we were leaving Egypt. We ate matzah uh, with the Passover seder. Right when we were, when right, right before we left Egypt. Some people say that's why we eat three matzahs. The matzah we ate in Egypt, the matzah we ate during the, with the Seder Pesach, and the matzah we ate uh, as we left Egypt. Now, this, so we, there was matzah that we ate in Egypt that sustained us when we were poor people. And he says, that's what we're supposed to remember with the matzah. The bread of our affliction, this is the bread that sustained us when we were afflicted. And he brings this story, and he brings this story about his backpack that he had. It's a cute story. I'll send this to you. You can read this. But he says, like when I was in, when I was in, uh, like a, a student, he had this ba- this backpack that they took everywhere, and he was like, he was scared at that time. It was like an academic institution. He was like in Israel, and it was hard for him. And this backpack, he brought everywhere he went. That backpack, like like, made him feel always comfortable and good. And he says, this reminds, this is similar to the bread of our affliction. We remember the we remember the bread that sustained us when we were in our toughest times. And he says like this. Um, our inclination is to turn away from the difficult periods of our lives and never look back. We want to forget tough times, to be done with them. The memories are painful. After all, perhaps we are even ashamed of how we live back at what things look like. The Torah commands us to eat matzah of our, of our lives. Remember those people, those things that kept you going. Never forget what sustained you, what got you through the miserable time. But sometimes we're going through tough times. There's that one person who's there to tell us something nice. 
It might have been that one, uh, I don't know, that one article of clothing that, that like we loved, or there could have been like a story or like uh, an idea that you remembered or, or, or encouraging words where something sustained you in your tough time. That's the matzah. And the idea behind this is that you're supposed to remember Hashem. Hash- not just remember Hashem saved you. That's just remember how Hashem's with you. Remember, think about a long time ago when you're suffering, how Hashem sustained you through that one thing. Just like the matzah sustained Am Yisrael when they were in Egypt, it was poor person's food. We had something to eat. So too, that was God. When you thought he had abandoned you, he was there nourishing you with the matzah. Matzah that presents the presence of God in our lives and appears he has abandoned us. Matzah is God's providential hand, working steadily but quietly. So I think that's a beautiful idea. That's not just bread of our affliction. Not just, well, not just remember the tough times. Remember how bread sustained us when we were in Egypt in our toughest times. We still had what we needed. To remember Hashem in our toughest times, how Hashem sustained us through whatever, through a backpack, through bread of affliction, through whatever. That's, another, that's a beautiful way for explaining matzah. Let me just see if there's any other ideas you want to share with you. Um, <clears throat> so, Had All right, I, I have like five or six different explanations for Had Gadya. You know the story? Raise your hand if you know Had Gadya on Zoom right here. Okay. Here, how many people know the song Haggadah? It's a very weird song. What is it doing in the Haggadah? What's it doing? If you turn to page 47, one little goat, <clears throat> a cat came and ate the goat. A, uh, a, a, a dog came and ate the cat. And a stick came and beat the dog. The father, uh, and it keeps going over and over and over again. Okay. Two nice explanations for this. One explanation is Rav Asher Weiss. He says, Hashem takes care of his sheep. Am Yisrael is like the sheep among all the nations. Every generation, different nations come up to, to devour us. And they devour each other. But in the end, Hashem is in charge. In the end, Hashem will make sure that we'll be protected. Hashem takes care of us. So in the end, Hashem oversees it all and will make sure that uh, like justice will be, will be uh, what's the word, will be a minister. So I think that's just like a Shem takes care of a sheep. Interesting is that the sheep actually ended up dying in the story, but we'll overlook that. Okay? Um, so here's the best explanation I think that there is for Haggadya ever. Okay? That's what I think. It's the best explanation ever. It's by a friend, a rabbi of mine. I love this explanation. And this is, it answers two questions. Why is this weird song here? Number two, why is it at the end of the Seder? So I'll explain to you in short. Uh, I have to look at uh, his explanations here. You can see it. I explained this in the video I put out. And it's a whole different way of understanding this. Many explain this as different stages in Jewish history. Many interesting explanations for this. But he explains it like this. Rob Dobby Schwartz is a friend of mine. He graduated from Yeshiva a few years after me. Um, he said that we, during the whole Seder, I explained this like a few years ago in how it works. We at the Seder Pesach, What's the purpose of it? We explain many, there are many different reasons for, for going through this whole process. But one main explanation is to remember those who are suffering among us today. We suffered. Hashem saved us. What could have been, though, if, if Hashem didn't help us? We could have suffered. Therefore, we should think about those who are suffering today. Passover Seder should be a call to social action, according to this. Who's suffering among us today? What can we do to help them? Supposed to be thinking about that. If we don't help them, then their fate will be that of those people in the Haggadah. Hashem gave us, gave uh, placed in this goat, one little goat, in our hands. We didn't save the goat, a vulnerable goat. What happened? The cat came and ate it. The cat could be whoever, could be some sort of enemy, some sort of negative person, some some uh, uh, tormentor that afflicted the goat. We had a chance then to save that individual from somebody else who's harming them. We did it. As long as you don't intervene in history, these things keep happening. One person's eating up the other, harming the other. We have to intervene. If we don't intervene, Hashem in the end will help out. But why should we, why should that happen? We have responsibility. Just like Hashem saved us, and we saw the benefits of that, we see this through the whole Seder Pesach. We should stand up for those who are suffering and try to make their plot, uh, their, their, their lot better. If we don't, we'll just witness on the sidelines, people get one person getting eaten up and suffering by the, at the hands of another. Like, that's why the Seder ends with this. Because it's, it's, it's a call to social action right at the end of the Seder. That's a beautiful explanation for how to get you.
So I think we got to like maybe 20 from our tourists here. Hopefully, does anybody find something that they could use at their Seder? I hope. Okay. One, two, three ideas you could use for your Seder.